There's so much uh, innovation that blockchain technology has spurred um, all throughout all throughout the world, um, and uh, I have you know absolutely no doubt in my mind that this technology is uh, is going to affect everybody. Um, I would you know I would say uh, in in 10, 20 years time frame um, there won't be you know, a human being whose life is not impacted um, by this technology. I'm Perry M. Boring, the founder and president of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. We are a trade association that specifically represents the blockchain industry. My path to this industry is kind of unique. I used to work on Capitol Hill. I worked for a member of the Financial Services Committee. Um, my biggest interest is in economic and monetary policy, so I worked very closely on any relate, um, issues related to finance, economics, tax, budget that went through the House of Representatives. I was briefed on a technology, a digital currency called Bitcoin, that operated outside of any type of government or organization or company. And to me, that idea of a monetary system that nobody controls was just absolutely fascinating and really prompted a very deep personal study. So for several years after that, I, I studied this technology uh, of Bitcoin, um, and that really led me to eventually um, dedicate my career to this technology. Um, I come from a background of technologists. Um, my father and my brother and um, most of my uncles all work in IT. Um, so it's, I guess it's in my genes. Bitcoin in the year of 2013 is the greatest gift you could have given any journalism because that was one of the most interesting and exhilarating years. Um, that was when we had the very first ever Bitcoin conference. It was in San Jose. It was in early 2013. And I was the only person with a camera that showed up to that event. Um, and that was also the year that the price spiked over 3,000% in one year. Um, one of the big notable um, uh, events was also Cyprus went through their bailout and the people of Cyprus started buying Bitcoin um, because they really didn't know what was going to happen with their currency and that uh, created a huge amount of interest in the technology globally. Uh, and then we also had all these crazy and salacious scandals uh, with Silk Road and Mt. Gox and Liberty Reserve. So as um, you know, again, as someone who um, was working in the media, but really my um, expertise and my background is in public policy, also living in Washington, D.C., um, really got pretty concerned when you start seeing headlines um, like, you know, Bitcoin associated with drug money and other issues. Um, that prompted a lot of scrutiny from the regulatory community. Um, there were multiple hearings on Capitol Hill. There was a senator who called for a ban on Bitcoin, um, all in response to uh, some of these you know, uh, more salacious events. Um, so I started calling for the industry to have formal representation in Washington, one, to make sure that the policy community, that the regulators had full information, accurate information, high quality, high integrity information, information about this technology um, because we really didn't have any other resource for that. Um, so over time, um, that, that spurred into um, the chamber. That it really was um, an opportunity that kind of fell in my lap. It's something that I was calling for in my writing um, and calling for in the work I was doing in the media. Um, and over time, I, I garnered a, a pretty big community of um, investors and entrepreneurs and C founders and CEOs in this space who said, Perry Ann, um, you're right. You're, you're right that we really need some type of representative um, in our nation's capital that can be a resource. Um, however, we live either in New York or in San Francisco. Um, we don't want to move to D.C., um, so why don't you do it? <laughs> so it's... Um, um, it's something that um, I feel like I was very much called to do, and it um, was an exhilarating move to leave everything I was doing to jump into this space. I don't use the word disruptive. I really don't. I, I, see, it as, I see it as an evolution. I, I think uh, I'm careful about using the term um, disruptive because it, it can be um, you know, a scary term to just throw around. And, and what we really want is for the business community 
the incumbents, your traditional Fortune 500, 100 companies. We want them to learn about this technology. We want them to explore this technology, start investing in it. Um, and if, if you approach them of, oh, this is going to disrupt your business model, it's just going to turn people off. So a better way to approach it is this has a lot of powerful and potential benefits and could have uh, you know, implications for different types of, of businesses. 74% of the world's population, according to the World Bank, does not have access to basic financial services. In my home country, in the United States of America, which is one of the most wealthiest countries in the world, um, about 50% of the population does not have access to basic financial services, including bank accounts. There is a huge amount of people around the world that don't get to experience and be a part of the global economy um, because they don't have access to the financial system for a variety of reasons. I do think this technology will lift uh, a lot of people out of poverty, but will also be an inclusive technology that allows more people to engage in global commerce. Blockchain is changing the world. One of the greatest gifts of this technology, of its creators who are still anonymous today, is one, the fact that it's anonymous, but two, that it's open source, that anyone can have access to it. Um, that's truly a powerful thing and, and has the opportunity to lift um, a lot of people um, out of, of poverty, give them jobs, um, and give them the opportunity to innovate. Um, one of my favorite stories and someone that you, you should consider um, speaking with um, is a lady in Afghanistan who has, um, uh, you know, in Afghanistan, women really don't have basically any basic rights, um, including um, being able to have a bank account. Um, but, uh, uh, you, know, there, you know, the laws don't say anything about having a Bitcoin wallet. Um, so there's been a lot of opportunities um, for women in regions of the world um, to utilize this technology in very um, uh, creative ways. Um, that are giving them greater access to be a part of, you know, again, the, the global economy. Social media has been an incredibly powerful mechanism to organize people. Um, it, it, it pretty much was the catalyst of the Arab Spring, and it's how uh, the people, you know, throughout um, that part of the world were able to organize and communicate how they were going to you know, protest and, and, and help bring about change in, in some of these um, hostile regions of the world. Uh, the problem with Twitter is you can shut it off, you can turn it off, you can block it. Um, government regimes can, can you know, set up, uh, 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 block the access um, to the site so people won't be able to use it. Um, a blockchain-based application, a communications application like Twitter, um, really could um, potentially be incredibly powerful um, in areas of the world where people need to be organized, where people need to be able to communicate with each other uh, to, to, to protect themselves, um, but also to, to demonstrate for, for multiple reasons. Uh, so these are some of the use cases that I've had the privilege of, of seeing um, from the, the you know, early, early business sketches. Something that is... I think somewhat unjustified is that governments today have a monopoly on currency. It hasn't always been like that. This is really more of a, a recent phenomenon. Uh, and if you look across the world, our monetary system is basically a, a global experiment uh, that is not going to last. We're seeing countries all over the world that have all sorts of inflationary issues. Their, their monetary systems are very sick. Uh, and that's going to continue um, to um, get worse. Um, the, the, the more we continue to um, use centralized um, monetary policy mechanisms. My wish for blockchain technology is that it will democratize currency, that consumers will have the option of what they use to trade goods and services. No longer will we be forced to only use uh, money that the government calls money, but you'll have the option of using other types of currencies, whether that's Bitcoin or Zcash or something else that hasn't even been uh, created yet. Um, I think this technology really can um, be a alternative to these centralized monetary systems and really empower people uh, all over the world to be able to take control of their purchasing power.
One of the biggest challenges that I've seen in this industry is just basic communications. It's a very, uh, it was really born out of a very technical community. Uh, we haven't seen very many people who have been able to take the, the great work that the technical community has done and really explain it to the masses. And that's a big goal and priority and mission of the chamber is promote the acceptance and use of digital assets and blockchain-based technologies. But a big piece of that is just communication. Uh, and it's also, um, as a community, being able to come together. We have a lot of conflicts in our community in terms of being able to agree on uh, you know, basic issues, um, like scaling is really, I guess, the biggest one that the community is currently divided on. Um, but being able to see this from a human aspect and a more personable uh, situation as opposed to just chat rooms and, and operating on your computer, uh, being able to make this real, being able to make this human, being able to explain it to the, the business community, the policy community, um, but also constituencies around the world uh, is something that needs to happen, something that I'm passionate about, and something that as a community we need to spend more time and effort on.